Go ahead and open up your Bibles. Uh, I don't really know where to tell you to start today because we're going to kind of be all over the scriptures. Go, go back into Genesis 15. And if you're joining us for the first time, maybe this year or maybe ever, this series to me is one of those that I think every year when we walk into January, the series that we lean into, it sets the tone for the year. And as we kind of finish one year and get ready to transition into a new one, we always seek God for, in, in the last few years, like a specific word, like in, in 2020, God gave us courageous, and boy, did we need it, because the Lord knew that we were going to face what we faced in 2020, and we leaned into this whole concept of courageous. Last year, we opened with forward, because it was time to get out of the past and start moving forward, and this year, we've said it's this word promises, because this is what I deeply believe to be true. You will never consistently submit to a God you don't completely trust. That for most of us, what's standing in the way of us in leaps and bounds in our faith, in our walk with the Lord, in our relationship with Jesus is a trust issue. That in Scripture, God, God doesn't want us to, to merely believe in him or have some measure of affection for him. He's asking us to trust him, to trust him completely. You can believe in God. You can even have some measure of affection for God, but not trust him. But it's when you decide that you're going to trust God that things in your life begin to change. Trust him in such a way it's going to impact and affect the way that you live your daily lives. Because can I just remind God is not impressed just with, with people that, that, that come to church. God's not even impressed if you read your Bible. It's doing what the Bible says that makes all the difference. I will continue to say that to our church and remind you, the devil knows every word in Scripture. You got to live it. It's got to impact your life. It's got to, again, it's got to affect the way that you approach relationships and money and career and the everyday, what seemed to, see, seemed to be even insignificant choices. God's word needs to, to shape how you approach those decisions. And you will never submit, fully submit, consistently submit to a God you don't completely trust. And my entire goal in this series that I think I know how long it's going to be is to remind you that he can be trusted that he can be trusted, that our God can be trusted, that I know there's a lot of people in our, in, in our church, in our community, in our world that have trust issues because people have hurt you. People have said one thing, done another. You've had broken promises from spouses, from parents, from loved ones, siblings, but he is not like them. He can be trusted. And in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23, which is kind of the, the verse that we've been using to kind of jump off of during this series, it says, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And this book, which is so much more than a book, is the active living word of God. And it shows for centuries he has proven he will do what he promised. That our God, the reason why we can trust him is because our God does not make a promise and fail to keep it. Come on. There is not a single moment that God said he would do something and it didn't happen. If it didn't happen, he never said it would. Because God does not lie. He can be trusted. Every series is different. There's sometimes that God puts a series on my heart to teach. And well before we even get to part one, I know every part. God's made it very clear. This is what you want to say in part one, part two, part three, part four, part 15. And there's sometimes that God doesn't do me like that. Sometimes he says, this is, this is the series I want you to teach. This is the topic I want you to lean into. And he kind of gives it to me a week at a time. Those aren't very fun at times. Or sometimes he'll give me like, okay, I want this, this and this and this and this here and this there. And then the week of God just begins to speak into my heart, the things that he wants me to say. And I was very certain about parts one and two of this series where we talked about just this reality of trust and how, you know what? The enemy is not afraid of people who just believe in him. What makes the devil shudder is people who trust him because those are the dangerous folks. And from the beginning, what the enemy is, the enemy's never really, in all of scripture, you don't see a single place where the enemy tries to create an atheist. Because nobody is more aware of the reality of God than the devil. What he wants to do is erode trust, not just destroy belief. And then last week, I hope it was a game changer. Where we talked about covenant. 
And now when I say that, if you, did, if you don't ever listen to another message I preach, go back and listen to that one 17 times a day because it changes things. When you realize there's a reason why we call it Old Testament, New Testament, Old Covenant, New Covenant. Our God is a God of covenant, but that is not a word that most of us really understood maybe till last week when we started talking about the whole concept, the beauty and benefits of living in covenant with God. But in the middle of the message last week during our 11 o'clock gathering, God told me what to preach this week. And now that's hard because, God, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to preach this one. Don't be talking to me about next one just yet. But it happens in what God says to Abram right before this covenant ceremony begins, right before we lean into this moment where, where God comes down after putting Abram to sleep and he walks the walk of death, that part of the covenant ceremony for Abram, when the smoking pot and the flaming torch, when Jesus walks in our place to say, I will be the representative because you'll never be able to hold up your end of the bargain. So I'm going to walk in your place. I'm going to take the curse so that you can have the blessing. But did you notice last week what God, God said something to Abram right before that happened? Go back into Genesis 15. Look at verse 12. It says, as the sun was setting, Abram fell into a deep sleep and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. Then verse 13. And when I read this verse in our 11 o'clock gathering is when God stirred something in my spirit about what we needed to lean into this week. Verse 13 says, then the Lord said to him, know for certain that for 400 years, your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own and that they will be enslaved and mistreated there. Right then, when I read that verse at 11 o'clock, God said, Matt, you need to remind people that God said there would be suffering. You need to remind people that God said there would be suffering. That before they walk through this covenant ceremony, before God starts to paint this picture of this beautifully beneficial relationship we get to have through living in covenant with him because of what Jesus has done, God says to Abram, before I promise you relationship, I need to point to hardship. But before I promise relationship, I need to point to hardship because this covenant relationship does not make us immune to hardship. God said there would be suffering. And I said, God, I don't want to talk about that because it isn't fun. And I'll be honest with you, as a preacher, I very rarely step off this platform preaching about suffering and feel like it is beneficial at all for most people in the heat of it. So I tried to ignore God. All sat last Sunday afternoon, I kept hearing those verses in my head. And I'm thinking, God, I ain't preaching that. You need to go ahead and give me something new. And can I tell you about my week? Monday morning, I get up. I have a meeting with a young man that's part of our church. I get here, and he's already here. And we sit out in the lobby and chat for an hour, hour and a half or so, talking about the impact of watching his dad begin to get sick at a age 11 and suffer through sickness through the vast majority of his life, only to finally pass away a couple years ago. And talk about how he's still trying to process the five miscarriages that he and his wife have walked through, suffering. I still say, God, I ain't doing it. I go in and I sit down in my office and I begin to start getting ready for the week and I look at the set list that Christian has planned for the day and the first song in there that actually we didn't even do, but it was already in there, was the song Egypt. I'm like, God, what you doing? I done told you no. About 10 minutes later, I go to check my email for the first time for the day. And one of the first emails I read is a prayer request for the daughter of a friend of mine. 
Chris Vernon, who's a really good friend, started a church down in Wilmington, Crosswinds Church. If you've been around Vintage very long, you've heard us talk about them. When the hurricane came through, we sent them several thousand dollars in partnership to help minister to people down there. He's a great friend. His oldest daughter is in her early 20s. She just had a beautiful baby back in November. And here in the last few weeks, they found cancer on her lung, in her liver, on her lymph nodes. Suffering. 10 to 15 minutes after that, check my inbox again, and it's an email from a guy named Rob Steiner to let me know that his nephew, Kane Steiner, part of our community, was found dead over the weekend. I want to know if our church would host his memorial and walk with him through this, 22 years old. On Wednesday, I listened to a podcast a good friend of mine named Heath does, and it was the four-year anniversary of his wife passing away from a long battle with Huntington's disease in her early 40s. On Friday, as I'm preparing to find a way to preach the memorial for Cain and say something that might help our community and their family, I get a Marco message from Christian about a couple that's connected to a lot of people in our church. Their kids go to Vandalia Christian and the Rubios were coming home from a vacation, leaving the airport early on Friday morning and in a head-on collision and killed instantly. Suffering. And I said, all right, God, stop. I'll do it. And I was reminded, this is why, unfortunately, so many people don't trust God. Can we just be honest that the reason why so many people struggle to trust God is because we just can't make sense of the suffering. But here's the reality we have to wrestle down. Someone you can't trust is someone that hides things from you. Someone you can't trust is someone who says one thing and does another. Someone you can't trust is someone who lies. And when it comes to suffering, our God has not once tried to hide that reality from his people. If there's one thing that you can glean from scripture, it's there whether you want to understand it or not. God makes it super clear from the onset that suffering will be a part of the human existence and no one will be immune to it. Never once does God try to make us say, hey, you, and I know there's been some preachers out there that have gone sideways. God, you follow Jesus. I can't guarantee you you're going to be rich and healthy and all those things. If you follow Jesus, I can't guarantee you anything, but you're probably more than likely going to suffer. And it's, it's, it's woven all throughout the scriptures that God... Jesus looks at his disciples in John chapter 16, verse 33, and says, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. Then look what he says. In this world, not you might, not it's possible, not even that it's likely. What does he say? You will. God promises there'll be pain. We're talking about promises. Yeah, we love this promised relationship, this covenant relationship we get to have with Jesus, we get to have with God because of Jesus, but nowhere, matter of fact, it actually says very clearly, I promise you there's going to be pain. But when we walk through hard things and when pain comes, our natural reflex is to say, why? Why? And now I can, I can give you the general answer why they're suffering in the world, it's not going to help, but it's true. Sin. The presence of sin ushered in the reality of suffering. Okay, let, me, let me take you back into the garden. Genesis chapter 2, verse 16. And the Lord God commanded the man, you're free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, I promise you, you'll die. God promises that there will be suffering, that sin 
in his presence ushered, ushered in the reality of suffering. That God has not tried to hide this from us. God has not tried to hide this from us. There's not a, you, I would even challenge you to find one book in all of the Bible where God doesn't point to the reality of suffering as a part of the human existence. I mean, you look at places like going to 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12 through verse 19. It says, dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you're blessed. For the spirit of glory in God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or a thief or any other kind of criminal or even as a meddler. Verse 16. However, if you suffer as a Christian, don't be ashamed. But praise God that you bear that name, for it, is, for it is time for judgment to begin with God's household. And if it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who don't obey the gospel of God? And if it's hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? So then, those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. That God, look at me, church, God has never once tried to hide the reality of suffering in the human experience ushered in because of the sin that is present in the world in which we live. And I know when we start asking that, that why, we can drown in it. And sometimes wrestling with why is good and it's healthy. Because let's be honest, there's some suffering that we are experiencing and you need to ask why, because the why is through your own choices, through your own decisions, through your own disobedience, and you're going through hard things because you're making bad choices. Come on, anybody ever had self-inflicted suffering? Am I the only one that's going to be honest in the room? That there's stuff that, that I'm, I'm hurting, I'm suffering, and I'm mad at God, and God's like, well, then stop. Stop. But we also know that's not always the case. That there's sometimes there's suffering by choice, but sin there's sometimes there's just suffering that doesn't make sense. That's where it gets difficult. How can I trust a God that would I don't really know how to appropriately answer all that. <laughs> As a preacher, sometimes I sit across from people and they're saying, why am I suffering? You know, I say, I have no idea. Man, I'm doing all the right things and I'm making all the right choices and I'm trying to live my life right and I'm, I'm in the word and I'm doing all this kind of stuff. And, and, and sometimes that, that suffering is, is that lingering consequence of choices because let's just be honest, sometimes we make decisions that have long-term consequences that we just can't avoid. Does that make sense? Talk to me. It's just the reality of it. And when we accept forgiveness, God gives us eternal salvation, but he doesn't always give us just an out, an escape from the consequences of those decisions that happened in real time. Go read the story of David. Go read the story of Bathsheba. Go see what happens in the aftermath of that. So I don't don't know how to answer all those whys. But you notice that what he said to Abram, he didn't say Abraham, Abram. He says, of all the things he tells him to know for certain, back in Genesis 15, he didn't say know for certain that this is going to be fun. <laughs> of all the things that he wants Abram to know for certain, know for certain suffering's coming. Because I don't want you to, I don't want to hide this from you. I don't want you to not see it coming. And I also don't want you to think that when it comes, somehow it's because I'm, I'm mad or I'm necessarily punishing you, punishing you in that moment. Don't let the hardship think you that there's been a, se- a severing of the relationship. Like, trust me through the hard. That the promise doesn't come, come with the promise that we're immune to suffering 
or problems. It comes with the promise of his presence and peace through it. Because when Jesus said, in this world you have trouble, then he says next, but take heart. I have overcome it all. So I think there's a better question. If we're going to endure seasons of suffering, the better, there's a better question than just why. Sometimes you need to wrestle down the why. and You see what you need to learn and how you need to grow and see if you're suffering from self-inflicted wounds. But if suffering is inevitable, to me, a better question is, how do we make it bearable? Right? If, if suffering is inevitable, a better question is, all right, how, do we make it, how do we make it bearable? How do we get to the point? What do we lean into? What do we understand from God's word that, that will teach us how to, how to not be crushed by it and consumed in it? And this week is I've tried to process what's happening in our community. And as I try to think about what I could say sitting on that platform to to Cain's, Steiner's friends and family on Friday. There's some things that God has reminded me of this week that I just want to quickly allow us to lean into. You ready? Say amen. amen. Never believe for a second that God is indifferent to it. When you're suffering, when you're going through hardship, when you're in the heat of pain, never for a second believe that God is indifferent to what you're experiencing. What I'm saying is, never think he doesn't care. You ever said that? God, why am I going through this? Don't you even care? Never for a moment think that our God is indifferent to what you're going through. The second thing is I want you to know this. Never forget God is able to identify with it. That's two things I tried to say as a part of Cain's memorial on Friday. Never believe that God is indifferent to it and never forget that he is able to identify with it. You say, Matt, how are you so convinced that those two things are true? The incarnation. Again, that's a, maybe a big churchy word like covenant. The fact that God stepped into it. That God didn't stay in heaven looking down from afar. He came to earth. He put on flesh and he embraced the human experience. He became like the created in order not just to die for us. That was a huge part of why he came. It was a necessary part of why he came. But if all he came to do was die, he could have done it much before he was age 33. He came to embrace the human experience, to show us how to live and to feel pain, to feel loss, to experience grief. Our God knows what it's like to be physically beaten. He knows what it's like to be emotionally abandoned when all his friends bailed on him at his worst moment. He knows what it's like to experience loss. More than likely, at some point, his earthly father, Joseph, has died. He watched Mary and her sister grieve over Lazarus. And what did he do? He wept with them. He is not indifferent, and he is not unable to identify with it. That's our God. And I don't know about you, but that gives me some peace. It changes the way I pray. I couldn't imagine talking to a God that had no idea what it was like to go through what I'm experiencing. He suffered. We just sang, son of what? Suffering. He suffered through it. John says, John 1, 14, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Look no further than the incarnation for all the evidence you need that he is not indifferent or unable to identify with what you're going through. That's our God. One of the things I think is far too often unnoticed is that reality. Go back into Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. It says, therefore, since we have a great high priest 
who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God. Listen, let us hold firmly to the faith that we profess For we do not, listen, we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness. But we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. So let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and grace to help us in our time of need. See, if if suffering is inevitable, a better question is, how do we make it bearable? And to me, suffering becomes more bearable when I understand that when I pray, I pray to a God who is not indifferent or unable to identify with what is causing my heart to cry out. One of the things that happens far too often when we suffer, when we go through hardship, when we experience pain, and maybe I'm just speaking to me, is we withdraw. Anybody else do that? It's like you just want to pull away. You don't want to see anybody. You don't want to talk to anybody. You don't want to have to explain to anybody why you can't get through a sentence without crying. You don't want to answer the questions. Because people, people can be stupid. You ever see this, and you want to say, How, why would you ask me that? And I know they have good intentions. Come on, don't hear what I'm not saying. And, and, and we all appreciate it. But sometimes, sometimes we just ask really silly questions, and people are, how are you doing? How do you think I'm doing? And I know our intentions are good, but can we just all, like, we get to the point where we don't, we don't want to, we ask that question. Talk to me. Let me know I'm not crazy. I appreciate the 10 of y'all. But so what we do is, is we just start to withdraw. And then what I tend to do is, well, I just need some solitude. Because that sounds all spiritual. That's what Jesus, well, you know, Jesus often withdrew. Yes, he did. There's a fine line between solitude and isolation. And this is what I wrote in my journal this week. Solitude can ease it but isolation will not solve it. There's a space for solitude. Come on. There's a time when you just need to just be with God, just you and him, and let him minister to your spirit and soak in his word and spend time in prayer and say things to him that maybe you don't want to say in a public space. But when you cross that threshold from intentional solitude to really unhealthy isolation, it won't solve it. That if, if, if we resist all relationship, eventually we'll be overcome by hardship. That there's something necessary about community to bring healing and suffering. So what happens in that space is really important. I think about 2 Corinthians. I'm going to skip over that verse from Job, and I'm going to come back to it. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. It says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. For just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. If we are distressed, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which produces in you patient endurance of the same sufferings we suffer. And our hope for you is firm because we know that just as you share in our sufferings, also you share in our comfort." He said, we comfort others with the comfort we have received from God, that God teaches you how to walk through hard things, that God teaches you how to endure really difficult things so that what you learn in that moment, you can share with somebody who else who will need it at some point in their story as well. I deeply believe that rarely, if ever, does God teach you something that he doesn't want you to share with somebody else, that it's not just for you. 
But I also think that we need to understand that the best way sometimes to help people through suffering is to not speak a solution into it, but just sit silently with them in it. Just to, and I know, like, there's something about our culture. When, when people start telling us their problems, let me, let, me, let me tell you how to fix that. Let me say something. Or even, again, we, let me just give you some, let me give you some scripture. Anybody ever give you a scripture? And in that moment, it don't really help. It's true. Sometimes God needs to give you the gift of shut up. So can I say that? Yeah. I think about Job. There was a time when Job looked at his friends like, y'all are terrible. Go read it. They've come in and he's going through this hardship and they give these big long speeches and Job's like, would you just be quiet? Would you just do like what you did in the beginning? The most helpful thing that happened in Job's story happens in Job chapter two at the very beginning. Look at it. Because there's not a single person in scripture that we identify more with suffering than Job, Amen. Job chapter 2, start with verse 11. When Job's three friends, E, B, and Z, y'all know what he did. He said, what's up, Z? He wasn't saying that name. Heard about all the troubles that had come upon him. Says they set out from their homes and they met together by agreement to go and sympathize with him and comfort him. And when they saw him from a distance, they could hardly recognize him. They began to weep aloud and they tore their robes and sprinkled dust on their heads. And then look at verse 13. Then they sat on the ground with him for seven days and seven nights. And no one said a word to him because they saw how great his suffering was. That was probably the most comforting thing that any of his friends ever did for Job. Number one, they, just, they were just paying attention and they traveled to his house and they saw his suffering. And it says like they, he, they did something to, to let him see that they were broken with him. And then they just sat with him in silence for seven days and seven nights and said nothing. That sometimes the greatest way that we can serve someone who is suffering is to sit silently with them in it and just to be present. One last thing, how I think we endure suffering is to be reminded that in covenant, all suffering is temporary. In covenant relationship with Jesus, in, in walking in the promises that he gives us, all suffering is temporary. All suffering is temporary. That even, even when when. We die, even in death, as followers of Jesus, we're ushered into glory. We exchange the, immor the, the mortal for the immortal. We exchange these earthly tents for a heavenly dwelling. All in covenant, all suffering is temporary. Second Corinthians chapter four, verse 16. Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is eternal, is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Romans chapter 8, verses 18 through 21, Paul says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits an eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. Because listen, for the creation was subject to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself would be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into freedom and glory of the, and glory of the children of God. That in covenant, all suffering is temporary. That in order to make the inevitable suffering bearable, we're reminded that the God we serve 
He is not indifferent to it or unable to identify with it. That solitude can ease it, but isolation will not solve it. We need to sit with other people in their suffering and just be present as they grieve. We need to constantly be reminded there's nothing in this life that God doesn't walk with us through and that everything we experience is temporary but the eternal glory that God has promised us because of who he is is worth the wait. Would you bow your heads, close your eyes with me. I want to read to you a quote from a guy named A.W. Tozer. Written in the book of righteousness. I've heard the last sentence I'm about to read my whole life. But I want you to hear the entire quote. A.W. Tozer said, we tend to think of Christianity as a painless system by which we can escape the penalty of past sins and attain to heaven at last. The flaming desire to be rid of every unholy thing and to put on the likeness of Christ at any cost is often not found among us. We expect to enter the everlasting kingdom of our Father and to sit down around the table with sages, saints, and martyrs. Though through the grace of God, maybe we shall. Yes, maybe we shall. But for the most of us, it would prove at first an embarrassing experience. Ours might be the silence of the untried soldier in the presence of the battle-hardened heroes who have fought the fight and won the victory and who have scars to prove that they were present when the battle was joined. The devil, the things and people being what they are, it is necessary for God to use the hammer, the file, and the furnace in his holy work of preparing a saint for true sainthood. It is doubtful whether God can bless a man greatly until he has hurt him deeply. God said there would be suffering. He didn't hide that reality would be a part of the human existence. And it's so easy to drown in the why. But today I'm going to invite you to step into the how. Step into the things that can make the inevitable suffering bearable and to just sit in his presence and to close our time together I'm going to ask you to do something that's a biblical concept that very few of us have ever really understood or implemented there's a word in the scripture called lament lament you've seen that Old Testament book in your Bible Lamentations but there's this concept of lament in scripture and essentially what it is it's a desperate crying out to God so what happens in Psalm 6 where it says Lord do not rebuke me in your anger or discipline me in your wrath have mercy on me Lord for I am faint heal me Lord for my bones are in agony my soul is in deep anguish how long Lord how long Turn, Lord, and deliver me. Save me because of your unfailing love. Among the dead, no one proclaims your name and who praises you from the grave. I'm worn out from my groaning and all night long I flood my bed with weeping and drench my couch with tears. And my eyes grow weak with sorrow and they fail because of all my foes. Away from me, all you who do evil, for the Lord has heard my weeping. The Lord has heard my cry for mercy. The Lord accepts my prayer. And all my enemies will be overwhelmed with shame and anguish. They will turn back and suddenly be put to shame. It's a psalm of lament. Would you stand? Again, heads bowed, eyes closed. I want to ask you to do something something that's going to take some courage. Today, if you're in this space, if you're in the room and you're, you're in a season of suffering, can I ask you to come and just sit at the front and allow other people just to come sit with you in it? 
Just come on. Go ahead and come on now. If you're ready, just come on. You can kneel. You can sit. You can put your back up against the side, however you want to get most comfortable. But I just want you to just come. And if even if maybe if you're not comfortable sitting, you can stand. If you say, I'm in a season of suffering. I'm in a season of struggle. Just come and sit. Because one of the things that's necessary, you can't overcome suffering if there isn't a moment of sincerity. You have to get honest in order to find hope and healing. And you say, man, I'm just in a season of suffering. Just can I invite you just to come and sit and soak in the reality. Soak in the reality that he is not indifferent or unable to identify with your suffering. Sit in the reality that you don't have to sit alone in this suffering, that there are people in this church and in this community willing and able to sit with you. Sit in the reality that this suffering is temporary, even if it's been prolonged. Come and sit. And church, I want you to come and sit with them. I want to invite you who feel so led just to come and sit, maybe put a hand on somebody. I don't need you to say anything to them. You pray as you feel led silently, but just come sit silently with the folks that are up here acknowledging suffering in their lives. Just come and sit with them. Come and sit with them. Come on and sit with them. God, I pray that right now, God, that your spirit would move in this room, that you would speak to hearts, that you would challenge us in this time to lean into you. And God, I know there are people in the sound of my voice that are experiencing some of the worst seasons of suffering they've ever known. And it's painful and it's dreadful and it's breaking and it's crushing. And God, I pray that right now that they would just lean into your promises, that they would know that your incarnation is the only evidence we need to know that you are not indifferent or unable to identify with what we are experiencing. That they would feel the hands on their shoulders or pressed on their back and be reminded that they are not alone, that they have a community of people that maybe they don't even know very well, but who are being their intercessors right in this moment. And God, remind us that nothing is beyond what you can't heal. And it's all temporary. Speak, Lord, as we worship you. May your presence saturate this place.